everybody. Welcome. It is Thursday. It is the Media Vine Summer of Live. I apologize for being a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties, but we are here and we are talking. <laughs> it it might have been Chris Peach. He called himself out. I, I was going to leave it vague and, and let you guys make your own determinations, but he claimed responsibility. So without further ado, I have two wonderful guests with me today. I have Deacon Hayes of Well Kept Wallet and Chris Peach of Money Peach. Deacon, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your brand and your, and your journey to becoming a uh, financial blogger. Sure. So, yeah, we started the site back in 2010, or I should say, I guess I started the site. It was just me. Um, and it was a way to tell people how my wife and I paid off debt. Uh, we paid out 52 grand in 18 months. And uh, I know Peach has a similar story he'll share. Um, but that that was just a, an amazing thing for us to say, hey, how, how do we share this message with other people, right? So we wanted to really focus on how to save money, make money, and pay off debt. Uh, and so back in, in 2010, it was really just a, a blog just to, to help people. And then just started learning um, about growing traffic, SEO, Pinterest, uh, you know, all these different things to, to drive traffic to the site. And so uh, in 2013, quit my full-time job to work for myself and uh, been loving it ever since. Nice. And Mr. Peach, will you do us the same honor? Yeah, so I didn't start, I got started way after Deacon. In 2015, I got started and a uh, very similar story. My wife and I went completely broke, lost everything as far as our, our money in our bank accounts. We didn't have any money left over in our bank accounts, overdrafted. Uh, and I didn't even know what a blog was, but I remember doing some research on Google on how to get out of debt. And uh, along the way, I, you know, going through this process, I found Deacon and actually Deacon and I became good friends. And he's the one that first told me about this thing called a blog. And uh, I was like, this is interesting. And then he told me, he's like, you know, you can make money blogging. And I had no idea that this was even a reality. Uh, I'm still a full-time firefighter to this day, uh, but it's been, it's been an interesting process of going from completely broke to paying off a bunch of debt to now helping people do the same uh, online and being able to generate, you know, a, a pretty nice income as well. So it's been, it's been a cool journey. So that's really interesting. And I'll, like the way I got introduced to influencing influencer marketing, in the blogging world was my boss said I want an influencer program. So I started Googling. How did you guys learn about blogging? I know Deacon, you kind of brought in Chris, but how did all that progress and, and what sources and resources did you find along the way? Yeah, so I'll start. So for me, um, I actually hosted mine on WordPress. So it was like deaconhayes.wordpress.com or whatever was my my website. And uh, and, and so it was really just that was the, the first deal. And then, you know, there's Tumblr and Blogspot and all this different stuff. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of learning from other people. Um, and so I looked for people that were like big players in the personal finance space. And so uh, at the time, uh, PT money, budgets are sexy. Um, holla, I'm just putting you know, that, that out the J money. Um, but uh, there, there were some people, Mr. Money Mustache, uh, that were really just, they were making waves and teaching people about money. And so uh, I learned you know, about the blogging aspect from them and then uh, learned about Neil Patel and Rand Fishkin from Moz uh, as far as getting SEO traffic. Um, and so really just kind of looking for who are those key players in the niche that I want to be in um, and then figure out what are they doing well and then emulate that, right? Not, not, um, not copy, but, you know, in my own way, emulate what is successful with their brands. And so that's kind of uh, how I got into it. Mr. Peach. So for me, I mean, in the very beginning, ironically, as I found Deacon on Facebook, but it wasn't, I didn't know who he was. It was an article that was in Business Insider. And uh, so I had shared it on my Facebook page. And somebody, a mutual friend that we didn't know, you know, knew each other said, Hey, you know, this guy you just shared on your Facebook page, he actually lives in Phoenix and you guys are only about five miles from each other. So we ended up getting coffee. And this was the first time ever hearing about the word blog. You know, I, to me, honestly, I thought blogging was recipes that women posted online and that's kind of where it ended. I had no idea there was a whole blogging world out there. And uh, so we just had a cup of coffee, he shared with what he, what he did. And uh, I remember he told me, he's like, you know, it's not hard to get started on a blog. And he gave me like five tasks. And I went home and I did all five that day. And I told him like, hey, I did everything you said. And uh, he was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you actually did that. And then I started searching and I found, I'd say the, the thing that I did the most was listen to podcasts. And so the first podcast I found in the digital online space was um, Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income. That was probably the, the very first one. And then he had Amy Porterfield on the on his podcast who talked about Facebook. 
And then uh, John Lee Dumas was another one. And so those are my three that I basically learned a little bit from in the very beginning. And then there was a couple other ones on email marketing and stuff. But in the very beginning, it was just, I listened to podcasts all day long. If I was at the gym, if I was at work, if I was, if I was doing something where I could put headphones on and listen, I was listening to podcasts. Nice. That's awesome. And really, I love one of the greatest things I've seen about the financial blogging industry is how much you guys rely on each other and are such a community. And I, I don't know, I know that exists in other forms, but it's very interesting to see and really interesting to see in person at FenCon. I mean, it's like you guys are at summer camp and hanging out and it's, it's a cool <laughs> thing. It, it is. I was, I was blown away. I had my first FenCon last year and you guys are nuts in all the best ways. Um, so we'll come back to FinCon in a second, but I wanted to ask you guys, um, so finance, like in the world of blogging, I think that finance blogging is considered by many to be really different, both in the way that you guys go about your, uh, your craft and in the way that you're perceived by outside people. Um, so why do you think that is? Do you think that is? And, um, and yeah, tell me why you think that is a, a thing. Um, do you care if I go first, Deacon? Go for it. I care. So I no, think yes, I think there's just so many different niches inside the world of personal finance. So uh, it's not just like a blanketed topic, like every blogger is going to talk about finance. There are super small niches within there. So there is, you know, minimalist type uh, blogs that are people are talking about how to cut back and, you know, tiny houses and stuff like that. There is the retire early blogs. Uh, there's the investing blogs. There's the student loan blogs. There is the, you know, we have a friend that runs the college investor, uh, you know, very niche specific. So the cool thing about personal finance is if you want to be a personal finance blogger, you're, you have a whole bunch of different avenues you can go. And, it, and I think they, you know, we, we've all heard this before when we go to these conferences, they all say the riches are in the niches. And that's true. I mean, you could talk to everybody or you could talk to the people that, that you know the best, right? And so if you're somebody that's, you know, incredible at investing or whatever, maybe that's the only route you go is you talk about all the different ways you can invest and which there's tons of them. If you're, if you're a real estate guy, there's so many real estate uh, ways you can go. So I think that's what makes it unique is compared to a lot of different other types of industries. And Deacon. Yeah. And I, and I would say another thing is it, it's, it's not as interesting sometimes, right? Like it's not, uh, it's not like Hollywood gossip or it's not a mom blog, you know, like where, where you can, you can have some really interesting stories, you know, like, um, I, I mean, I, I think that we make it interesting, right? We talk about yeah. kind of the, str the struggles that, uh, people that like, we have debt success stories on our site. Right. And so we had a woman that had cancer and she paid off her debt while getting chemotherapy, you know, like that's just unreal. Right. Like, so you find the interesting things in life that, um, can inspire other people for a topic that could be boring, right? To talk about just dollars and cents, right? So um, I think that's the other cool thing about it is trying to figure out whether it's someone did retire early or they paid off a ton of debt or whatever it is, highlighting that and finding like the, the details in it that make it uh, exciting and interesting uh, to read and engage people. Yeah, I definitely, I think that it's really interesting to see um, the way that the, the way that you guys do that, and I want to talk more about that. How do you infuse that personal touch and that interest in there to make people as passionate as you obviously are about personal finance because of your own backgrounds? And then also this interesting thing about financial bloggers and anonymity, and how do you inject your personality while retaining that? Yeah, so I, I will say I've never been anonymous, right? So like meaning I've always used my name, but I do know people that have used a pen name, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so I I think uh, I thought about it because at one point I was posting income reports, you know, and I know that's, that's a big thing in the personal finance space, right? People want to share their income reports as a way to inspire other people. But then at some point you feel kind of uh, exposed, right? Like if I'm making a lot of money, do I really want everybody in the world to know but that though so, I know some people have chose to be anonymous and, and have kind of that veil um, and it does give this kind of more um, I don't want to say authentic but you can be more open about stuff right um, where I know you know if, if it for me I'm, I'm kind of you know I'm a little bit more closed off on that stuff now um, when it comes to the website, because I think the average reader, they don't know who for, for Wellcat wallet, my brand's a little bit different than peaches. They don't necessarily know who I am. 
uh, the site is more of a personal finance website. And so, um, so for me, that does kind of give me a little bit of a cover of like, if you were to say like, I don't know. You know? I think we froze. Oh. No. So you have that choice. Uh, scenes, or you can be, you know, he's got. I think. Okay, I think Deacon is frozen a little bit. Chris, can you jump yeah. in there? Yeah. Uh, so as far as the uh, being anonymous thing, I've always put my face on the front of my website. Um, you know, my name is Peach and it's called Money Peach. So uh, you know, it was never uh, it was never my idea to not be front and center of the site. Um, so I don't do any income reports or anything like that. So I don't have to go down that road route or worry about that. But one of the things I did do in, in the beginning that was a mistake is I really did not tell anybody out there that I was a firefighter. And so for the longest time, I thought to myself, well, man, I'm a personal finance blogger talking about how to save money, get out of debt. They're pro people are probably looking from somebody from the banking world. Who's going to listen to this firefighter? And I remember I have a mentor and he says, Chris, there's only one you, really. There's only one Chris Peach who is a firefighter blogging about money. Use that to your advantage. You know, everybody knows a firefighter. Everybody knows a police officer. You know, you can position yourself as the guy down the street who, you know, went through the same problems that somebody else might be going through, but you got out and you found out a way to do it and you don't speak in financial terms. And, you know, I don't wear a tie to work. I wear a tank top. And we talked about this before we hit record. It was a choice, right? <laughs> I, this is my, this is part of my brand is I don't want to lump myself into the, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I want, how I'm different is I feel like, you know, using my, my profession and my voice as kind of the everyday money guy, that was all intentional from the very beginning. I love that. And I, I think that, yeah, always speaking from a place of authenticity is, is what's going to enable you to keep growing and keep doing what you want to do. If you're coming at it from trying to be something you're not, mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to make that sustainable. It's, so, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that that's true. I think is Deke, uh oh, we lost Deacon. Maybe he'll come back in a second. So I wanted to talk to you about what is the finance blogger strategy for content creative uh, creation and, and what's important to your audience. And um, it seems different, again, to DIY, food, parenting, um, de decor, things like that. So if you could talk about that for a second, how you how you go about that process. So it's definitely evolved over time. So in the very beginning, when you're starting a blog, and I don't know how deep we want to go into SEO and stuff like that, but our our domain authority was next to nothing. Meaning we were brand new. Google didn't really recognize us as anything yet. So it wasn't like we were going to come out and rank for anything that we wrote for. Meaning we were never going to be found through Google search or anything like that. And so therefore, we could pretty much write whatever we wanted because whatever we wrote wasn't going to be found unless we have we push that out through email. Um, and through social media, because like I said, the Google machine was not paying attention to us early on. That takes time. And I think everybody in the blogging world understands that. So in the beginning, it was writing articles that, you know, I was passionate about. And I did 100% of the writing in the very beginning. I was doing up to three articles a week. And when, I feel like when you're passionate about something, when you love talking about something nonstop to your friends, you can write about it all day long. And so it was never a, a chore to me to come up with content. Um, but what I did do is I created a spreadsheet. And uh, I just, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday was our posting schedule in the beginning. And I just started writing down idea after idea. And sometimes they would overlap. So that would become one post. But I remember early on creating a six month content um, of, of different things we would write about. And they were all different. Now, fast forward to today, three years later, our domain authority has gone up a little bit. We could start being found on the first page of Google. So now we start looking at what do we want to write about, but also what can we be found um, like as far as search and we kind of play that balancing act of, okay, you know, I'm really passionate about this. Uh, right now, there's just no way for us to be found in that. So we'll put that on hold. But right now, I mean, we want our blogs to grow. I think everybody on here, you know, wants traffic. So we got to be more intentional about when we are writing content, we want to make sure that there's a possibility that we can make the first page of Google. And that's kind of where we start. That is good. Deacon is back. Hold on. I'm bringing him back. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's a, a struggle that, hey, Deacon, welcome back. Can you hear me okay? Uh-huh. We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, so I had just asked 
Chris, about content creation for financial and financial bloggers and how that might be different from others. And it sounded a lot like what I think all bloggers can struggle with, which is I want to write about what I want to write about and balancing that with what, as Chris called, the Google machine wants and will help you rank. So how, how, talk to me about content creation for you and, and how that might have changed in the course of your blogging career. Yeah, when, when I started, it was very similar to the I just want to write about whatever makes sense, right? Um, but then I realized that if nobody finds it, what good is it? So um, then I started researching, like, well, what are people actually searching for in Google? Um, and then writing content around that. Um, and then also, like, looking at Pinterest and seeing, like, what stuff's getting engagement on Pinterest and then writing content like that. And then there's um, there's other things I've tried, like Google Trends, where you can see what's trending. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things. We're also um, doing trending articles. Like, I have a what's it called Google now or something like that on my phone where basically we'll bring in articles about interesting things. Right. So I saw this article about, you know, you're not going to have to sign for credit cards anymore. I'm like that's interesting. No one's Googling that, but it's something interesting. So uh, we wrote an article on that. So really just kind of figuring out like what, what is stuff that's trending and then also what are people actually searching for? So that way you can start to make content that people are actually going to see and read. Very good point. And how and how often are you posting? Chris, I know you mentioned three times a week in the beginning. Are you staying on that schedule? How do you determine that? And how did you pick your days? So in the beginning, like I just used the firefighter method. I'm like, I think Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be a, a good time to post, <laughs> right? So that was my method at the beginning. Uh, right now, we, we post three times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And uh, that's about with me still working a full-time job and having kids at home and stuff. That's about as much as I can handle at the moment. Uh, we'll obviously want to scale that and improve that to maybe five days a week. But right now we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So for us, we, we have been doing one day a week. So every day of the week, um, we're actually going to scale back though, because I, I, I've become a believer of quality over quantity. And so, uh, we were publishing a lot. And so we're going to go probably back to three days a week, similar to peach. Um, but really focus on the quality, you know, making sure that we're including things that maybe other sites aren't including. Like, uh, for instance, we're going to have charts, you know, to compare different services within the article. Um, you know, we have custom graphics sometimes that are, are very pinnable, you know, so really kind of focusing on the quality over quantity. Uh, and we're not really too concerned on the days that it's published. I know that that's been a concern for some people if you have like a following. Um, because for us, our content is more long term. So it's not just the people that are going to read it today. It's the people that are going to read it every day, uh, whether it's coming from, you know, the different social media channels or from you know, or search engines. Um, so it's more about just establishing a schedule that works for you and your team um, and then being consistent about it. So speaking of that, we actually had um, we have. I know you guys know, but at Mediavine, we have a lot of our staff are bloggers and have their own personal websites that they're running while they're working with you guys, which I think is an advantage. Um, but one of our bloggers asked, and our staff members asked about wanting to expand into a staff team, going from being a one woman show to moving in the way that you've moved. And how does that happen? What advice would you give someone that is looking to scale in that way? Yeah, so I, I'd say the first thing that I did is I identify the tasks that I don't want to do, right? There's a lot of things that, um, you know, like editing posts, scheduling posts, uh, creating Pinterest images, you know, things I'm just not good at. And so uh, once you identify those things, then finding the people that can fill that void, right? Like, okay, I can't do Pinterest images, so I need to find a graphic designer who's reliable and who creates good graphics. Um, so for me, I hired someone from a, co a local college um, that got their degree in you know, graphic design and, and, and so they're, they're more focused on that. Um, for the scheduling side of things, I found a VA, a virtual assistant. So um, their sites like Upwork, um, I found mine within the FinCon community, which is awesome, right? So if you have that for, you know, whether it's recipes or health and fitness or mom blogs, if you have a network of people asking them, like who do they use for their virtual assistant? Um, that's how I found mine and she's been awesome. And so really just kind of tapping into those two different sources of saying, okay, here, here is a place where I can get local college people, you know, that are good at, at graphic design. Here's a place where I can find someone to do the virtual assistant type work. Um, and then as far as freelance writers, cause that's a huge thing for blogs, right? Um, I reached out to a friend that had a course on how to make money as a freelance writer. 
And I said, hey, can you post this in your in your Facebook group about um, I need writers? You know, this is what I'm willing to pay. This is the, the criteria. And she posted it and I got tons of writers, right? So Facebook groups are also a great resource. That is excellent advice and a great way to outsource and colleges are teaming with people to work with. Uh, Chris, so you're, you're, so you're writing three times a week. Are you the sole author for the blog? So for the longest time I was, and uh, I see Destiny asked the question about, you know, starting off in the beginning, I did, I wrote three articles a week. Um, I would say they were anywhere from 1500 to 2000 words. And it was a lot to do in the very beginning. But like I said, I was so passionate about it that it never felt like work, even though I was staying up till two in the morning, writing these articles, I loved doing it, but that's not sustainable. So we ended up looking at, okay, can we, we, we still want to post, we still want to be relevant. So it was the hardest thing in the very beginning was finding writers that fit your brand, because that's kind of the hardest thing I think to do is when you're so used to writing for so long and, and then you're going to allow somebody else to write on your blog. And uh, so that was, that was one of the biggest challenges I had personally, because I use my voice in my writing and now somebody else was going to be writing and using their voice. And I was like, Oh, but you know, we said, well, we'll test it out. We can always take the copy down if we don't like it. And it worked really well. So uh, to destiny's question, we do have three writers that we assign. And uh, so they're writing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, uh, but one of the things that Deegan didn't mention that we both use is we use a program called Asana. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Asana. It's kind of like Trello, but I don't use Trello, so I don't know. But I use Asana. I know Deacon uses Asana. And there's a guy, going back to the FinCon community, there's a guy there named Matt that actually put together this like $27 course on how to use Asana. And it's called Asana for Bloggers. And I went through that and I was like, this is life changing. So it's it's a free tool and it's all online where you can assign different writers, different things. Um, you could, we have a thing where we sign somebody a Monday task, a Tuesday task, a Wednesday task. They finish it. When they check it off, it goes to like the project manager and then she schedules it. It goes to the image makers. So it's all automated. It's behind the scenes and it allows you, if you wanted to scale, it really allows you to scale because everything's kind of like lined up in order. We are actually working on Asana and the marketing team. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> colleague just posted about it and I need to take your friend from FinCon's course so that I can stop using my spreadsheets and my notepad on my computer. Not that I do it's a that. It's a game changer. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I will take your word for it. Uh, so let's let's shift gears a little bit. What is relevant and impacting financial pub publishers right now? What, what are your current pain points? What are current events, current issues for you guys? So you want me to, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Deacon. You go. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, because this, this was a recent thing, and, and I know for some people, GDPR was a deal where, you know, you've got the people in Europe, um, you know, making legislation that basically affects how we have websites and how we track information and things like that. Um, and so, you know, there was this kind of rush to figure out, okay, how important is it? What do we need to do? So at the end of the day, we just updated our opt-in forms to tell people, you know, we have, we have an updated disclaimer, we have updated, um, we have push notifications that get sent to people and we have email. So, um, for people in Europe, you know, they, they get this custom notification that tells them what we do to track our information. Um, so there are some people, at, I know one guy in particular that blocked all traffic from Europe because he's like, I don't want to deal with this. So that's another way to do it. You know, you figure out what percentage of traffic do you get from those state, uh, from those countries and then just block them. Um, mine was just update the, uh, update the opt-ins. Yeah, we definitely, uh, we, GDPR was a four letter word at Mediavine, but we got through it. It was just, it was a, it was a, it was a thing. It was a situation. Mr. Peach, how about you? Anything that is particularly timely for you in the finance blogging world? Uh, I'd say the biggest pain for us is you gotta be, we gotta be careful what we choose to write about because sometimes I'll give you an example. We might write a post where it's like the top bank promotions right now. And it's like, yes, we think we can rank for this. This is going to be great. We're going to put this wonderful article together. And then these bank promotions change like every, you know, five days they're changing it out. And so having to go back that, you know, over and over again and edit and update and change things out. Uh, that's something that I learned the hard way. And it took me like five times to learn it because I kept doing the same thing and I'd go, Oh my gosh, they took that program down and we just wrote about it or, or, you know, we had, we, or one of the mistakes I made is in our, we put the number, it was like 52 ways to do this in our URL. Well then that one company no longer existed. So I'm like, <laughs> Great. Now we have 51. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. Um, 
in the personal yeah. finance world, banks and stuff, they're moving, they're changing, different offers are happening. So that really puts us in a bind sometimes. Yeah, it's got to be hard to balance the current thing and, and wanting to be on the cutting edge in, a, in an industry that thrives on evergreen content. I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. how. And you don't want to change that URL or any 401 redirect. So that's interesting. How did you deal with the 52 situation turning into 51? We found another one. We just had a scour. <laughs> You just found it. You made yeah. another 52. That makes sense. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so I just got a question actually from our uh, from our director of influencer marketing, and she asked, uh, "How are you guys? So you know that this is the year of video at MediaVine. Um, how are you? Are you taking advantage of of the popularity of video, and how does that work in the finance niche?" I'll start with that because so. I was really bummed when YouTube updated their uh, minimum requirements to make money with YouTube. And so I had less than a thousand subscribers, so they basically shut it off, right? So now if we create video, we didn't make any money with it. Um, and so, you know, we know with Mediavine, you know, you guys, you actually have a much higher, um, I don't know if we call it RPM, but it's a much higher payout than YouTube. Uh, so we've been playing, yes, CPM, we've been playing around with that. Um, and so we can embed it on the website and see how it does compared, you know, to how YouTube used to do. Um, and we know that it's significantly higher. So that's one way. Um, but the other thing is we've kind of we've kind of scaled back on doing YouTube videos because we need 4000 hours worth of watch time. And so I've got dozens of videos and we have only 2400 hours of watch time. So I'm like, we'd have to continue to make more and more. So really, we're just kind of once again, more about quality over quantity, only creating uh, videos to complement posts. So really what we're doing is if we have a post about 80 ways to make money, we might make a video about 21 interesting ways to make money and embed it within the post. So that's kind of what we're doing uh, today. Mr. Peach. Uh, from, I would say for me, this is where I lack big time is video. Um, it just seems like there for, for, for me, and I, I think a lot of bloggers feel this way, there's a thousand and one different things that we should be doing. And for the longest time, I was spending that whole saying where I was an inch deep and a mile wide, and I was just kind of dabbling in everything. And so one of the hardest things for me was to start saying, okay, yes to certain things, but saying no to more things. And I would absolutely love to be doing much more video, putting video in every post. Um, and that's something that I want to do. But at the end of the day, there's just not enough hours in the day. So uh, we'll have to bridge that gap as it as it becomes more relevant. And I see that like video is definitely the future. I mean, Instagram's using now video. Um, I've gone to a couple of Facebook places where they're talking that video, video, video. And so I understand that, but the biggest pain point right now for me is where do I find time to add one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that conferences are, are super good at making you realize all the things you're not doing. It can be a little yeah. painful just to oh, yeah. sit in there and be, I'm so inspired. Oh God, I'm not doing anything right. Yeah. Uh, and balancing those feelings. Um, so, but you are not, you're not, not be doing video, but you are doing podcasting. And I wanted to talk to you guys about that as well as the other ways in which you've diversified beyond your blog, um, e-courses, speaking, printables. Tell me what you guys are doing in your, in your dabbles and, and what has been successful for you. So yeah, one, one thing for me is, is the podcast. I've been doing it since 2013. Um, and now it, it, once again, it, it's, it's, it's made to complement the, the current material on the website, right? Uh, originally, it was kind of a standalone thing, but now if I interview someone, it's kind of with the intent that we have a piece of content on the website that we can embed this podcast into where it complements it. Because for me, I'm an auditory learner. So I don't really read blog posts. I own a blog, but I don't read blog posts. Uh, I listen to stuff or I watch videos, you know? So for me, the podcast was a natural progression of, okay, if I want to reach people that are auditory learners in the blog post, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Deacon, how about you? I'm sorry, Chris, go for no, it. No problem. Hey, it's a, I'll, I'll take Deacon's name. That's right. No, um, so I have a podcast. And so when we started our podcast, it was, we, we, tr we tested things. So we tried a thing called money peach TV, and then we were doing the TV and we were scraping the audio and running the podcast. And it was all about personal finance. Um, but over time, we started kind of talking about the same thing over and over again. And I started bringing on people to help me as, as far as guests. And I noticed there was an uptick whenever we brought on somebody that talked about making money or generating income instead of cutting back. I noticed there was a big uptick in listenership. So we scraped the TV idea because it was too expensive and you know you have to do your hair every day. 
And uh, <laughs> we had this right behind me is this podcast studio. So it's this little carpeted box. And uh, so we do our podcast in there and, and we, we do it a lot on entrepreneurship, but a lot of the people that we bring on are bloggers or podcasters or YouTubers who, you know, found a niche, they're generating income and they come on and they teach people, you know, what they're doing, share their ideas. And then another way we decided to monetize off our blog was early on when we started off as a beginner, right? You're not going to really make, you're not going to have a ton of traffic. And so that, that means you're not going to have a lot of, you know, revenue coming in from places like advertisements, um, Mediavine, affiliates, stuff like that. Just not going to happen. And so I realized that I needed to bridge this gap before we started hitting, you know, thousands of visitors a month. And so I created a digital course based on a lot of the things we talked about in the blog. And then we started selling the, the course as well. So that was that really helped out in the beginning while we built our traffic. Good. Yeah, we're always we're all about the multiple revenue streams here, and not just not just one. So I'm going to ask the I'm going to ask a MediaVine question. Uh, how has MediaVine changed the game for you guys, if it has? And what uh, what would advice would you give people that are considering potentially joining MediaVine? Yeah, I'd say for me it was huge because uh, AdSense was what. I use at the time, right? And uh, I'm looking at the RPMs or CPMs and uh, they're very low, you know, so you have to get a lot of traffic to really make a, a decent living. Um, and so switching over to Mediavine was was huge because I think we're like four or five times what we were with AdSense. So uh, that, that was a big deal to where, okay, now we can actually monetize uh, the content, especially content that doesn't have like an affiliate, right? So we do write stuff that we think is good content, but it doesn't have an affiliate intent, you know, so um, we needed a way to monetize that. Mediavine definitely uh, helped us fill that void. For, for me, it was a complete game changer. And I don't want to mention any other names out there as far as uh, you go to FinCon and there's four or five different, uh, you know, advertising companies that are competitors to Mediavine. And so, you know, I was with one of them and, you know, they were like, oh, we're going to get you $9 to $10, uh, you know, CPMs. And Against AdSense, that's huge, right? Because AdSense, yeah. you're like at three dollars or four dollars. So that, so for if, you, if those are who are brand new, CPM is cost per thousand. So a thousand visitors, mm -hmm. what, what could you expect cost per thousand, or what would you make per thousand visitors? And uh, so then Mediavine comes along, and I remember like early on, we were like in the mid twenties, and I'm like, something must be wrong with their software. How can they pay us in the mid? It was just bl mind blowing. Like I remember telling Deacon, I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. Like how are they so much higher than everybody else? Uh, and then on another aspect of it, like once you signed on with a lot of these other companies, if you sign on with AdSense, you're never going to talk to anybody. You're a number. But if you sign on with some of these other companies, it's a difficult time to get in touch with somebody. And I remember I, I referred somebody to Mediavine and they must have mentioned my name. And I think you guys sent me a bottle of alcohol, which thank you. That was awesome. But I was like, who does this? Like, this is amazing. Not only do they have higher you know, CPMs, now I'm getting this bottle of liquor or one time you sent me candy. And I was like, this is so crazy to me that uh, there's a company out there that pays well and they're actually, they treat you well too, which is pretty weird in the blogging world. Well, we we do what we can and and booze and candy we found are never a miss when, we're, <laughs> when we mail them to people. So, um, so I'm going to talk about how you guys mentioned that you, Chris, you discovered uh, some resources through um, a Facebook group. And also I wanted to talk about expanding your reach and how you do that traditional and non-traditional media sources and syndication beyond your blog. Are you, I, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. What were you saying? Whoops. Okay, I, I said expanding your reach through uh, traditional and non-traditional media sources. So going outside your blog, potentially getting an interview somewhere or uh, syndicating your blog post to different sources. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of that. And so one of the things that I started to do early on is going back is I was writing all of my own articles. I was writing nonstop and I was also reaching out to other bloggers. I wanted to be a guest poster, which I think if you're starting out, you have to be doing that. And what happens is your name starts getting out there. And if you write good content, you, you can share that as almost like a portfolio, like, Hey, I've written for other people. I want to write for you for free. And so early on, remember we wrote for Geico. That was kind of a big deal for us. I mean, like I was brand new and Geico posted us not only on their online stuff, but in their, their print that they sent out in the mail. And, um, and then a company called Grow, um, they're the Acorns app, the Acorns Money app. We wrote for them and we, we wrote a couple articles for them. And then they said, well, what do you think about doing a syndication partnership where 
where we we borrow one of your articles a month, you borrow one of ours, and we share them. And so in the beginning, that's a win-win. I don't know how Deacon feels about it, but for me, that was a win because I had a low domain authority. I was still brand new. And for my name and a link to my site to appear on a bigger site became a big deal. And then lo and behold, they had a relationship with Business Insider and Forbes, an entrepreneur. And all of a sudden, this article that I wrote on my blog two years ago uh, ends up on Business Insider. And so that would have never happened without that networking and syndication. Mr. Hayes? Yeah, wow, that sounds so formal. Uh, yeah, so for, for me, I, I don't really do, uh, I don't do any syndication, but I did, I did do a lot of writing for other publications. So, um, so at some point, you know, I started with just one. So I think it was Clark Howard, which is a big in the personal finance space. So finding a site that you're like, hey, I really would love to write for this and figure out uh, what their criteria is. And then it kind of snowballed from there. So I was a writer for the U.S. News World Report, uh, a writer for Investopedia. So like bigger publications within the personal finance niche. And then I realized that I, I hate writing. So I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where um, it really depends on your skill sets, right? Like, so for me, I was willing to put in the effort up front because I knew that being able to get that exposure to get that out there um, it, it was huge. Um, so it's kind of, I did, I did a lot of that work up front. So now I don't have to, right. Um, but it definitely did pay off. Interesting. We are big advocates of syndication and, and getting good link love and being a responsible blog citizen. So I think that's a big thing. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, conferencing for you guys and, Obviously, we have to talk about FinCon because we already have been talking about FinCon. It's been brought up. Are there other conferences that you would recommend? And tell our, our, our listeners and watchers a little bit about FinCon and how to get the most out of it. I'm a huge fan of FinCon. And I'm a huge fan of conferences in general. Uh, and the reason why is it's not what you learn from the conference that lasts and builds your helps you build your business it's who you meet there and you're not going to meet these people and network with them and you know build those relationships completely online yes you yes you are to an extent but when you just like anything in life when you get in front of somebody face to face it's way different and uh so i remember in 2015 the fincon that was our that was the first conference i had been a blogger for three months i think and the first conference i went to was in charlotte which is for me that's a huge flight right i'm not making any money on my blog uh, I'm brand new and I'm flying across the country and I, I know nobody except for Deacon. I, I don't know anybody. And, uh, but that was a complete game changer. I, I can say this with 100% confidence. If I didn't take that trip to Charlotte, there is no way my business would be even close to where it is today. And so, you know, FinCons for me is, is, is something that like this year, I'm going to miss it, but every there's, I have, I have good reason, but I don't miss it. Like you don't, you have to go, um, if you're a financial blogger or in the financial space at all, you, that's one you have to go to, but then there's, there's so many conferences out there and I've gone to a couple of them. Yeah. They weren't the greatest conference, but the people you meet there are huge, right? Like, uh, we've had, we have people on our team that have come from conferences. And so I, if you, if you're going to spend your money on anything, I'd, I'd say, spend a little bit of money and go to these conferences because yes, the ticket's expensive, but it's not what you're going to learn. It's who you're going to meet. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I, I went to traffic and conversion in San Diego this year and I was not, I was not enthralled with the speakers um, except Damon John was there from Shark Tank, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and he did a decent job, but it was just kind of like, I didn't, you know, it's, it's, I really, it was the people that I met there, right? And and you have those conversations around a, a dinner table or at a, at a bar or whatever. Um, and you get an insight to, um, you know, what's working well for them. What, um, you know, you be bad ideas back and forth. How can we collaborate together, right? So um, there's all sorts of that type of stuff that happens. FinCon though, by far is, is my favorite. So, you know, whether you're a financial blogger or not, like being able to find a conference that actually, uh, you, where they actually had these t-shirts that says like, I found my people, right? Like you go there and you're like, these people speak my language. They know, you know, about compounding interest and, you know, debt amortization and yada, 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 right? Like normal nerd speak, right? Um, and so it, it was one of those things where you feel like, hey, I belong. Um, but but you also get to 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 figure out like how can we how can we impact more people how can we do this together not as competition but as collaboration. 
Yeah, like I said, last year was was my first FinCon, and it was it was a it was a quite an experience. And we're super excited to go back again this year. And we're sponsoring Ignite, and we're looking forward to to meeting even more personal finance bloggers and people in the space. It's it's a very different and very exciting, high energy. I guess would probably be the uh, adjective that I would use. It was you guys are animals, no question about it. Um, okay. So readers who haven't been following you for years may find it overwhelming to come to a personal finance site like me. I find it overwhelming. And how do you communicate to your readers how to get started? How do you how do you get people on a path where they're not just because I, I know personally I can get to a place where I just go, I don't know what these I don't know what this means and I'm gonna go eat ice cream instead of read this blog. So that is such a good question. And I wish you would ask me like ask me this in 2015 or 2016, because I was information overload in the beginning. I had, you know, it made sense to me, but I had every little category everywhere on the site and it was overwhelming. And what I learned, I don't know, there's a there's a book out there that I would highly recommend people read. It's called Story Brand by Donald Miller. Donald Miller, yeah, Donald Miller. And so one of the questions he asks in the book is. If somebody goes to your your site within the first three to five seconds, they should be able to determine right away what you do. And in the book, he gives a lot of examples so you can actually go see it. So for me, you go to my site and it was like scrolling this and videos going this way and things are moving. And it took, it took me as the owner of the site about 20 seconds to figure out what I did. So <laughs> I would say simplify it. Is as much as possible and and make like make it really simple. So if you go to our site at the very top before you can even scroll down, uh, it basically says, "Hi, I'm Chris Peach. Here's what I do," and then it says, "Grab the budget or go to the workshop." So two options, or you can close out. And then if you want to scroll and learn more, you can. But when somebody arrives at the site, especially on mobile, make sure they like check it on your phone. They should have one to two options max, and and it should tell me like what you do, right? So before it was just a picture of me. And when you went on mobile, it was a picture of me. I could be a gardener, right? I could be a cook. I could be a fine. No one knows. And so now we we try to use language that's like not in your face, but oh, this guy helps me with budgets. You know, like I get it. Deacon. Yeah. Well, first off, I want to say I think I'm gonna buy Peach a t-shirt with like a giant dollar sign that he could wear in that picture. So it's like super clear, but um, cause he would wear it. <laughs> or what about a uh, thought bubble? Like a big thought bubble. I'm thinking about finance. That could be good. I might do that and you should check it out cause you're going to get credit for it if I do that. Yay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So similar to Peach, like I, mine was more category based. So uh, we had 40 different categories on the site, right? And so uh, I just figured, okay, let's narrow down to three and that's it. Um, and so we have save money, make money, pay off debt. And so that makes it so much clearer that if someone comes to the website, they're going to look at what category makes the most sense for them and click on it. Right. Um, and then they're going to find, they can scroll through the articles and find the one that's most relevant to them right now. Um, and so that, that was kind of our, um, our approach instead of, um, having all these different categories where people can be confused and say, where do I begin? It's like, well, I have debt. I'm going to click on that one. Or, you know what? I need to save some money or I need to make extra money, you know, really make it easy for people to find what they're looking for. Absolutely. And, and like if we all know, they click away or they hit the back button and they're gone. You've lost them. OK, so affiliate marketing. Let's talk a little bit about this, because this is something that I, I am passionate about. I started an affiliate program for my, my previous uh, job, and I think it's something that can be really tough for a lot of the other blogging niches. I know it plays a huge role in financial blogging. Can you talk a little bit about how it how it plays a role on your site? And do you have any tips? How do you get readers to buy something you recommend? I'm going to let Deacon start because I've actually learned a ton from Deacon. So, I mean, he, he's like the godfather of personal finance affiliate marketing for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, get out of your stuff. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So really it was figuring out, uh, I actually took a course from a friend of mine. Um, it's called making sense of affiliate marketing. And so it was, it was one of those things like, I want to find out from someone that does really well, she makes six figures a month from affiliate marketing. So I'm like, eh, she probably knows what she's talking about. Um, and so one of the things that she recommended was finding like 10 brands that really match up with your audience, right? And so then I kind of thought like, well, who are the top 10 brands when it comes to paying off debt and making money, et cetera. Um, and then, well, let's write content around those brands, right? So if it's like how to make money with your home and then, Airbnb is going to be the affiliate that we talk about in there. How to make money with your car, 
you know, Lyft, Uber, Uber Eats, those are going to be affiliates. So really it kind of helps give direction to how we create content. Um, and it's a win-win, right? So the, we get commission for referring people, uh, Airbnb gets, uh, you know, gets revenue and the people that are signing up as a host get revenue, right? So there, there's this like, it's this, this magical uh, synergy that happens, right? Where with affiliate marketing, where we're connecting the end user with a brand and we're getting paid for it uh, and everybody wins. So uh, that's worked out really well for us uh, on Lookup Wallet. Chris, can you add something in there? Yeah, one of the things that I've, I mean, I'm gonna steal this from you Deacon, cause you taught me this, but one of the things that uh, we learned is that when you are promoting a, a product or service is two things is don't talk about it naturally. And I'm sure you guys have heard podcasts where, you know, this show has been brought to you by, and you know, right away, it's, it's a, it's, it's an affiliate link or it's a commercial, but then you might have somebody that just naturally flows and starts talking about, you know, a, a product or service that they use. And uh, so we kind of changed it from a, where it was like a, a pop-up box that said, you know, I love this product to, you know, if it fit in the article and we can just organically or natively kind of put that in there. So it made sense to the reader. Uh, we got a lot higher click through rate. Another thing too, is pay attention to your numbers. Your numbers are huge. So I know Deacon and I were big on EPCs earnings per click. And uh, so how we calculate that is okay. At the end of the month, I'll look at what did we make with this affiliate and how many clicks were there earnings per click real simple. And then, so we'll look at some posts and if we have four or five affiliates on there and, but they're like in a numbered order that will put the highest EPC at the top, because that's probably going to get seen more than one at the, at the bottom. And that that'll help you generate revenue right there by just making small tweaks is, you know, just looking at your numbers. So uh, EPCs, I think that, even early on bloggers should know what EPCs are and how to how to manage those. Those are excellent tips. Uh, we are unfortunately starting to run out of time and I hate that because you guys have been amazing and you are giving wonderful advice. I'm gonna come back to you with a final question and I think that's gonna be, if you could tell all our audience and the world one thing about what it is that you do, what would that be? And I will be back in just a moment. So guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to let you know that next week we are talking with Amy Sugarman of Sugary Sweets and Courtney O'Dell of Sweet Seas about unlocking RPMs, getting that RPM as high as you can, maximizing your content, viewability, all those great things that are gonna get more dollars in your pocket as we move into an incredible Q4 here at Mediavine. Now to Mr. Hayes, we'll start with you. Will you please go ahead and let us know one thing? Yeah, uh, well, we, we help people make money, save money, pay off debt, and so go to wellkeptwallet.com to find out more on how to do that. Excellent, Mr. Peach. We just take the confusion out of personal finance. We make it so the everyday normal person like me can understand it. And I'll, I'll do one more thing. If you could do, if you could send anyone to one piece of content, one post on your site, one podcast episode, where would you send them to start out? So for me, I would say passive income ideas. So if you Google passive income ideas, we should come up number one and then go to that post and figure out how to start making passive income today. Excellent. Chris. Uh, for me, if you just go to Money Peach and typed in budget anywhere on our site, uh, you know, our site kind of revolves around our budget, which is our lead magnet. And it's the tool that thousands and thousands of people are using. So that would be a good start. Fantastic. Guys, I've had a great time with you. Thank you so much for, for stopping by. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. All Cheers. right, guys. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye, everyone.